So I uh, hopefully you guys had a great Thanksgiving, and I just want to take a moment. Um, one of our faithful members, Richard Ferraro, his son, Louis Ferraro, passed away um, yesterday, I believe it was. And so I'd like to have a word of prayer for him. And um, if you know who he is, please give him a hug today. Send him lots of love. And uh, he's going to need a lot of encouragement as he walks this journey back to joy. And so let's pray for him, if you would. Father God, we lift up Richard Ferraro and his family right now. Father, you know the loss that they have gone through. And Father, we just pray that your spirit would minister to them, that you would place your loving arms around them, that you would comfort them, that you would give them your grace, you would give them your mercy. And most importantly, Father, they would feel your love. And Father, we pray this morning that your word speaks to ours, that I decrease and that you would increase and that you would receive the glory and you would receive the honor. It's in your beautiful name we pray, amen. So my name is Brad, and if you're new here, I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and it's an honor for me to be here to be able to share a message from God's word with you this morning. And there's a powerful story in the Gospels in Mark chapter 8, and it tells a story of Jesus where he fed the 4,000. And after he finishes feeding the 4,000, it says that he then was approached by the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the, of the Jews. And they came to him and they're like, Jesus, we demand for you to give us a sign. Give us another sign to show us that you are from God. And Jesus is like, nah, Pharisees, I'm not doing that. See ya. And it says he gets in a boat and goes to the other side. And as they're sitting there in the boat, Jesus gives his disciples a warning. He tells them, guys, look, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and King Herod. Don't buy into their way of the kingdom. Don't buy into the way that they feel God's kingdom should come. Watch out for them because they're not teaching God's kingdom. They're not living God's kingdom. Don't listen to them. And as soon as he finishes giving them this warning, his disciples begin to discuss, oh, we only have one loaf of bread. Peter, you really forgot all the loaves of bread? Like, they're talking about bread. And when Jesus recognizes this, he stops them, and he mentions these words, and I'll have them for you on the screen. Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? Seven. And he said to them, do you not understand? What is Jesus getting at? When he mentions you have eyes, can you not see? When you have ears, can you not hear? What is Jesus doing? He's reminding them of a passage from Jeremiah chapter 5. And in Jeremiah chapter 5, Israel was supposed to be God's people and God's salt and God's light to the world. And instead, they cared only about themselves. And so the people that were in their communities, the people that were suffering injustice, the people walking about in wickedness, God's people, Israel, said, I could care less because it's all about me. And he says, disciples, I want you to understand, I am warning you, wake up. It's not about you. I'm telling you about the most important thing in this kingdom, and you're talking about bread. And he reminds them, and he says, look, when I fed the 5,000, how many baskets? When I fed the Jews, how many baskets did you pick up that were left over? And they said 12. And he said, how about the seven nations, the Gentile nations? How many baskets did you pick up? And they said seven. And what is Jesus getting at? Jesus is telling us that his kingdom is about reaching the whole entire world. His kingdom is about taking the light to the darkness, to the darkest corners of the earth. It is leaving where you are and saying, I'm going to care about every single person because every person is made in God's image, and I'm going to go out and reach them. But all Jesus' disciples were concerned about was bread. I only brought one loaf of bread. 
What are we going to do about the bread? Jesus wanted to challenge their thinking to move it from themselves so that they would be concerned about his kingdom mission. And for me, being honest this morning, I know I'm not the only one in this room that struggles with this. I've had times in my life where it was all about me. I'm just going to live my life right now. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I'm going to do whatever makes me happy. I'm going to do whatever satisfies me. And so instead of me getting off my couch and going to be the light, I sat in my house and just made it about me. And the rest of the world that's stuck in injustice, that's stuck in their wickedness, are left with no hope and no way out. Because for many of us, we've made the Christian life about bread. You see, I know there's many of us in here as well. And as I look around churches across the country, when I look around churches in our community, I see a common trend among many churches. You want to know what it is? Here's what it is. We are more concerned about building our kingdom than building God's kingdom. Right? It's about how many people can we just get to come to our church and we're just going to make each other feel good when we're here, but making an impact in the community? Nope, that's somebody else's job. We're just going to make ourselves feel good. We're going to make the building nice. We're going to build up everything around it so our church property looks awesome. But the people that are stuck suffering the injustices, people stuck in their sin, stuck in their wickedness, are crying out saying, where is hope? Where is hope? And churches have basically reduced the gospel to this, get saved and get right knowledge. That's it. We made churches all about our spirituality. We made it about how can I be the best disciple that I can be. And then most of these churches are irrelevant to those in the community. The community wants nothing to do with churches. Want to know why? Because we've isolated ourselves from their lostness and from their brokenness. We've made ourselves the priority in God's kingdom. And church, quite frankly, we have been discussing bread. And it's time for us to have a call to action. It's time for us to actually put our feet into the community and leave our seat. If all we do is sit in a seat, the community never hears. The community is not in these seats. Look around. Look how many empty seats there are right now. And if all we do is show up on Sunday and sit in seats, why do we wonder, why aren't we reaching our community? I just can't figure it out. It's easy. God has called us to put our faith into action. And this is what Jesus is reminding his disciples. Stop talking about the bread. Understand our mission is people. It's every single person. Those that are different from you, those that hate you, they're all deserving of God's love because they're created in his image. Stop focusing on bread. So how do we break from the norm? How do we move from the bread to the kingdom? I wrote it down this way in my notes, and you can put it in your notes this way. It'll be on the screen for you. Here's what it is. If we can remember this, cities change when lights shine. Cities change when lights shine. And this morning, if you have your Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at just a few verses this morning, verses 13 through 16. And as you guys are turning there, we have to remember that this passage is found right in the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's a famous sermon where he's delivering to his disciples and everybody who wanted to listen. Jesus has ushered in. When he came to earth, he's ushered in his kingdom. And his kingdom is here, and he's telling his disciples, telling anybody willing to listen, God has acted in a new and unexpected way. His kingdom is here. And if you don't get about this mission, if you don't get about this vision, you're going to totally miss what God is doing. This is something new. It's exciting. This is completely different than anything you've ever heard before. And so he lays out this beautiful sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. And then we get to verse 13, and he says this, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste... 
How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You see, Israel was called to be the salt in the world. And what does salt do? We all know what it does. What does it do? Okay, that's flavor. Preserves, right? They would put it on meat, and it would keep the meat from going what? Bad, right? From getting rotten. So God called Israel to be his kingdom people, and as they lived out their faith in action, and they stepped outside and showed the other world that, hey, there's a God who loves you, and they're living differently. Instead of taking advantage of their neighbor, they're loving their neighbor. The world would sit back and go, man, you guys are making what I do, an easier place. They were there to make the world from going bad. But Israel failed. Instead of being different from the world and being God's people, they became just like the world. They started to do the exact same things as the rest of the world does. How's that? Well, they had power struggles in politics. We find that among God's people now? Yep, Jose talked about it last week. They had divisions in their community. Certain religious leaders couldn't get along with each other, so they fought and there was divisions. You have people that were making war to push their own agendas. Does that sound like God's people? No, that sounds just like the rest of the world. And here's what God looks at. Man, Israel, who was supposed to keep from the world from going bad, guess what? They're bad themselves. You ever had, imagine if you had a delicious meal prepared for you, and you take a bite, and you're like, wow, this has no salt. It has no flavor whatsoever. I know you guys have never experienced that at all. And then you take salt, and you sprinkle it on your chicken. (sighs) But it does absolutely nothing for the flavor. Would you guys continue to use the salt? What is it good for? It's good for absolutely nothing, right? Why even have it? I should just take this and throw it away. And this is what Israel was doing. They were useless as God's salt. They became just like everybody around them. And Jesus told his disciples that were there this day, saying, look, you need to be different. You need to live as I live. You need to love as I love. Because that is the only way that you can be salt in the earth is if you go out and love as I have loved you. You see, we don't have time to figure out what all those kingdom principles are at, but you can take the time later today and read Matthew 5 through 7, and you can see what a kingdom citizen will look like and what God will do in, you, in your life when you allow him to change your heart, when you allow him to move you to be the person God has called you to be in his kingdom. But see, in our churches, we've lost the idea of being salt. Many within our churches have become just like the world. You might say, Brad, I don't know if I can believe that. Really? Here we go. You ever see people that hold up signs that claim to be Christians that say God hates and then you fill in the blank, whatever you want it to be? Is that being salt? That's being just like the world. There's some people that say, you know what? I can look at porn. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not being the salt. Some say, I can live with somebody. I don't have to be married. It's cool. It's not being salt. It's being like the rest of the world. I'm not getting my way, so I'm going to complain until I get what I want. It's not being salt. It's being like the rest of the world. I have enough work to do myself. I don't got time to help my coworker get his stuff done. It's not being salt. I just need to do me right now. Can't focus on anybody else. It's all about me. It's not being salt. You take advantage of me, then I'm taking advantage of you. It's not salt either. I'm not helping the homeless. The homeless. I work too hard for my money. They can help themselves. It's not being salt either. And there's many. I can make the list go on and on, but here's what Jesus is telling all of us. That's bread. That's bread. That's bread. It's not the mission. The mission is the people in our communities. 
It is those suffering under the weight of oppression and injustice. It's those from broken homes. It's those that are broken people. It's those that have no hope. They're stuck in their strongholds. They're stuck in their sin. They're stuck in their wickedness. It is about them. And Jesus is saying, you guys need to get into action so that we can bring the gospel to them. You see, church, we can't stay here either. We have to take Jesus' challenge seriously. To be the salt of the earth, we have to live as Jesus lived. And when we do, we help our communities keep from going bad. And when we do, cities change when lights shine. See, Matthew 14, 5, 14 says this. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. And just like Israel was to be the salt, Israel was to be the light. See, Israel themselves had to live right as the salt, but then the light is where they had to go into the darkness where the lost people were and make a difference. They were to be God's light to everybody, not just their, their community of faith, not just their religious temples. They were to be the light to the most wicked people you could ever think of. They were to have the same vision that Jesus did, that it was about reaching everybody from God's kingdom. But they allowed those in darkness to remain in darkness because they cared only about themselves. They made their life about the temples. They made it about the rituals. They made it about the church traditions. They made it about the festivals. They made it about everything, their own little traditional customs. They made all of their life about what was best for them. And they missed out on being the light. And Jesus challenges his disciples and says, you will not be like Israel. You will be the true Israel who will take your light and you will shine it to the darkest corners. You will bring your light to the darkness so that darkness can be pushed back so that God's kingdom would advance. They would have to let their light shine in order to see their cities change. And he uses an illustration, and I love this illustration. As I was studying it this week, I actually thought about it in my head and I realized I'll tell you what I thought about it when I get it. He talks about how nobody lights a lamp and then puts a basket over it, right? And we all sit there and go, yeah, you know, we're supposed to give light to a house. But then I thought, you know what? Let me just do a visual here. Give me a second. I'm not handy, so you got to bear with me. So we have a light. Now, this is what you said. Nobody says you're in a house, it's dark. You turn on the light and go, all right, guys, I'm going to turn the light on so we all can eat dinner. All right, I got it on. Now, if you ever went to somebody's house and they lit a lamp, they turned on a lamp, and they immediately hit it so there was no light, what would you say? You are crazy. It's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Right? And literally, when I thought about it, Jesus, this is the dumbest thing anybody could ever do. And Jesus is like, that's the point I'm making. For you to be a disciple and to not let your light shine is the dumbest thing that we could do. Why? It's worthless. This lamp is useless if the light doesn't shine. You might as well not even have the lamp. And Jesus makes this ridiculous statement to say, look, if you are a disciple and your light doesn't shine, you're useless. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized, you know what, it's not a dumb illustration. It actually makes the most sense. Because for many of us, we have made it all about ourselves. And we choose to let our light shine only around other lights. And we keep our light to ourselves. We don't shine it for the world to see. And Jesus is saying, if that's what you do and you don't let your light shine, you have become useless to God's kingdom. And so church, hear my heart on this. I'm not pointing a finger at anybody because I've been here. I've had moments where I didn't let my light shine, where I hid it, 
So I'm with you guys. The challenge is for me just as much as it is for you. It's a constant reminder for us to put our call into action. You see, for many of us, we've taken the Great Commission and we've turned it from go and make to go and be. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. We changed it from go and make to go and be. Where we are more concerned about being disciples instead of actually going and making disciples. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Here's what I mean. You have Christian friends. You've joined multiple Christian life groups. You watch Christian sermons online. You listen to Christian music. You watch Christian movies. You eat at Christian restaurants. You attend Christian events in the community. You attend Christian conferences. You subscribe to Christian podcasts. You attend Christian concerts. And I could make the list go on and on and on and on and on. And then when somebody looks around and asks the pointed question, do you know your barber's name? Do you know your barista's name who serves you the same cup of coffee every morning? And all of a sudden we feel like those questions sting. And then some of us, we have a great answer for all of that. Well, see, Brad, here's the thing. <laughs> we are called to be in the world, not of the world. So I can't go to those places where lost people are. In, not of. Right? But all we've done is created a Christian bubble where we're just hanging out with a bunch of other lights. Just lights hanging out. Now, there's, it's good stuff to hang out with lights. But you are not called to be a light among the lights. You are called to take your light into the darkest corners of the earth. And as your light is shining in those dark places, it will push back the darkness because people will see there is something different. I hate you, but you treat me nicely. Why? I've done something terrible against you, and you've forgiven me even though I can't forgive myself. What is that? Your marriage was a disaster. Now it's beautiful. What happened? You see, the world needs to see what God can do with broken people like us. They need to see that we have our struggles. We have our ups and downs. But our faith in Christ is our rock. Our faith in Christ is our stronghold. And people need to hear. They need to know your story. You need to talk to people. My barber, I... I made a decision. I used to go in. I used to be that crazy person first available because I just wanted to get in and get out. And then about a couple years ago, God said, hey, why don't you get the same barber and build a relationship? Duh. So I had the same one. I know his name. I texted him. Hey, you there? And we talk. You see, this is what we have to begin to think about. Being the light is not just about coming and being around other lights. And if all you do is hang around lights, here's what happens. Here's what can happen to you. You can get a jaded view of what God is doing in the world. So many people will sit back that all they do is hang my lights, and their thought is this. There's just, God's not really doing anything cool in the world. The world is just getting extremely worse, and all these bad things are happening. God, would you just please come back? You ever hear people say that? You know what happens? I used to say that too when I was just hanging out with lights and not doing anything in the lost, with the lost. But here's what's happening. Those who are allowing their light to shine... Here's what they're beginning to see. They are seeing marriages restored. They're seeing a suicidal teenager give their life to Christ and have joy and happiness in their life, and now they have a Savior who loves them. You see, they're going in and they're seeing people who are stuck in their addictions, finally set free, finally living for Jesus as their, ki as his, as their king. And that's only happening because they're allowing their light to shine. God is doing amazing things in the world, but we will miss it if all we do is hang out with other lights and never embrace the darkness. You with me this morning? You see, I have a little flashlight here. I just want to make the point here. See, I have my flashlight on now, and I'm on the lights. Can you all see it? You can see it a little bit. But is it really adding anything to this room? So really making a huge difference. Ooh, look at me, look at my little light. <laughs> See, so many of us, we wonder, how come my life's not really standing out? 
How come I don't really see God using me to make a difference? If all you are are a light among lights, there's no darkness in here to push back. It's just hanging out with other people. This was the problem of Israel. They did it with the salt. They did it with being the light. We have to take this light to the darkness. It's the only way that we will shine out. Why don't you look at verse 16? Because cities change when lights shine. Matthew 5, 16 says, In the same way, let your what? Light do what? Shine before others. Why? So that they may see your good works and give glory to who? Your Father who is in heaven. The goal of shining your light is so that the rest of the world would give glory to your Father. And they would know your Father like you know your Father. We're just like Jose says, they will be able to say, Daddy, I'm finally home. It's the goal for each of us that as we push back the darkness, we can point them to our Father and say, he loves you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, Jesus loves you. He has purpose for you. There is hope, no matter how bad you think your situation is. The goal is for them to see that and give glory to your Father. And that's the secret to letting your light shine, ladies and gentlemen. This is the secret to you being the light is going out and letting your light shine. This is how God's kingdom is advancing. He started with 12 disciples and sent them out, gave them the challenge, be the light. And for all of us that have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, we are saved because the disciples said, I'm putting my faith into action. They weren't comfortable with just sitting in seats every single week. They were comfortable with being the hands and feet of Jesus, no matter how much danger they encountered, no matter how much trouble they brought into their life, because they knew the end goal was worth it for people to say, Jesus, you are king, you are Lord. It is worth it to let my light shine. See, sometimes I think, for those of us who grew up in the church, we have that little Sunday school song that we sing. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. But I think sometimes we kind of walk around and that it kind of makes us think that some of us, we're, we're afraid to let our light shine because we feel like it is a little light. And we kind of like, we walk around, hey guys, here's my light. Don't blow too hard, it's gonna blow my candle out. I hope you like it. We walk around because we think that we're not qualified. We think that we're not gonna have the right answers to what people are gonna ask us. And so we sit back and we say, oh, just, just let me learn some more. Just let me get some more knowledge and then when I'm comfortable, I'll go out. See, I had a period in my life where I did that. I wanted to have every argument and rebuttal in my brain when I was in Bible college. Like, all right, I'm gonna study every argument, counter argument, so when somebody asks me something, I'm gonna go out and witness. And so I did that for about a solid semester, and then I realized, wait a minute. As I'm sitting here getting all this knowledge, I'm having zero gospel conversations with people in the world. I am studying and preparing answers that no one is ever going to ask because I'm not actually out there talking to them, right? And so for some of us, we don't understand the power that is within us. We don't have a little light inside of us. It's not a little light that's going to easily be blown apart. Understand this. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same spirit that lives in you. Amen? And he has not given you a spirit of fear, but one of power, church. It is the spirit at work in you. And as you just are obedient and you just go out, and you say, well, Brad, what if they ask a question? I don't know. Then you tell them, I don't know. I'll go ask somebody. I'm going to go ask my pastor at the church, and then I'll come back to you. Is that cool? Yeah, that's cool. That'll be great. Guess what, guys? I do that. People ask me questions, and I have to say, good question. I've never thought of that. I will get back to you on that. And it's okay to say, because guess what? The point of this is this, is that you have the spirit within you, but it is the power of the gospel that saves, not you. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why is that? For it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. So here's the power, not you. You can't save. It is you just telling people the good news of the gospel. 
that you can be made right in Jesus Christ. Jesus is King and Lord, and whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And then you will receive forgiveness of sins, and your life will be put right. You see, you don't have to get qualified enough. You don't have to be afraid. You just go out and you just share your faith. It's as simple as you just having coffee with somebody saying, what do you believe? And they say, oh, I just kind of believe that there might be some supreme power. Or nah, nah, nah. What do you believe? Well, I believe that Jesus is God, that Jesus is king. And you just begin to have conversations about that. And that's you being a light and pushing back the darkness. For others of us, we might struggle with letting our light shine because we look at the lostness and the brokenness in our communities and we say, Brad, with this burden that I have for the community, I am only one person and there's only so much I can do. So I, I, and then it paralyzes us. I'm just not going to do anything then. I'm just going to sit back. And somebody else will take care of it. I'm going to ask in just a second, the lights are going to go off, Okay. So be prepared. Don't freak out. Nothing dangerous is happening. I'm having to do it. Okay? So go ahead and turn the lights off. All right. Now, for many of us, you see my little light right here? Got my little light. For many of us, we think, how is this little light in this big space of darkness ever going to push back the darkness? I'm just one person. I'm just one human being. Well, see, Jesus' goal was never for you to be the only solution for the world. Everybody who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ is also the light. So here I'm going to have her turn the lights back up, and here's what I want you to do. Everybody who has a phone and knows how to use your flashlight, I want you to turn your flashlight on. If you don't know how to use it, just hold it up and pretend you have it on, okay? So take it out, turn your flashlight on. All right? Now, in just a second, she's going to turn the lights off, okay? Now, turn the lights off. Now, I want you to look around the room, guys. I want you to look around the room. See, if we have all of us shining our light and each of us are doing our part, all of us will be able to push out the darkness in our communities, in our workplaces, in our schools, in business, in government, in wherever you find yourself. It takes each of us playing our part. Now give yourself a round of applause for your, you guys are awesome. We have a church that knows how to use technology. That's what we just proved. I don't want to hear anything different right there. So, but here's what I want you to grasp, is that you are not pushing back the darkness on your own. That you, God is, Jesus sees the big picture, okay? He sees every light that is out there in the world that is shining. He sees how much the world is lit up. And all he's asking us to do is, here's, here's the thing, here's what you need to do. If I give you a burden for something, you just become obedient and push back the darkness where you are. And if you play your part, and Brad plays his part, and Kelly plays her part, and every believer in here plays their part, then we are going to shine as lights in the world, as Paul says in Philippians. You see, and each of our roles are not going to be the same. Some of you might say, Brad, but I can't do what you do. You're not supposed to. There only needs to be one Brad in the world. Your calling and how you push back the darkness is unique to you, and you have to play your role. But I can't be like Amy Rittering and go to Africa. You don't have to. She's there right now. That's her light. She's letting it shine. You have to find out what is it that you can do. Let your light shine where God calls and leads, and then put that call into action. You see, this past week we were in North Carolina and we went to, on Friday, we went to this place called Mike's Farm and Restaurant. And it was extremely cold, so I was miserable uh, the whole entire time. It was like 40 degrees and it was, no, actually I wasn't miserable, it was fun. But what happened is here at this farm, this guy Mike took over his family's farm in the mid-1980s. And they used to sell tobacco and instead he said, you know, we're gonna plant Christmas trees and then we're gonna grow these trees and then we're gonna sell these trees. But they, they ha always had a goal. Their mission is to create a warm family atmosphere for every single person that arrives on their farm. And so they added restaurants and in this restaurant, they serve a family style meal. I don't know if you've ever been to one of these places, but they serve fried chicken, 
mashed potatoes, greens, beans, potatoes, tomatoes, greens, beans, potatoes, tomatoes, <laughs> all that stuff. So mac and cheese, corn, green uh, biscuits, gravy. I mean, everything I cannot eat. I just sat there and looked at it like, wow, that must be delicious, guys. You guys, wow, good. Another piece of fried chicken for you? Oh, I'm sorry. So I'm sitting there watching it. But all this stuff, and it makes people feel at home. It makes you feel like family. And they had gift shops, and they made their own desserts. And you could even watch the people, the workers, make the desserts and roll out the dough. And you're like, ooh, that looks amazing. I know it's fresh. And they've done a great job creating a family atmosphere. But then they also have this hayride that you can do. And they take you out. You're in a wagon, and you're behind, I think it's a tractor. I'm not a farmer, so I think it's a tractor. And so it starts off, and you go out, and they have Christmas display lights everywhere. But there's a certain point where Mike has chosen to let his light shine. The wagon stops, a song comes on through a speaker that's on the wagon, and you see a soldier dressed in uniform walking down a path. And you just sit and watch the soldier walk, listening to the song, and then he walks up to a live nativity scene, and just about the time he gets there to where baby Jesus is, it says, and this is where the soldier met his king. And Mike has chosen to let everybody who takes that hayride know that Christmas is all about Jesus Christ and people meeting their king. He has chosen to let his light shine by using a farm. Now, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sell Christmas trees. I don't even know how to grow a tree. So it's not my light. It's not supposed to be my light. But Kelly and I, our light is different than that. For us, we sat back and said, God has put a burden in our hearts for children in foster care. So we said, okay, God, we know we can't take care of every child because that would be crazy, but you know what? We're going to go through the training. We're just going to take care of whatever child you give us. We're going to play our part. John Bernadarni, are you here this morning? Yes, he's up there in the balcony. God has given him a burden to create a cookbook to give to families that are in need financially to help get the gospel, to get the word out through these recipes to them. And he didn't just say, hey, that's a cool idea, God. Maybe one day I'll start it. He's like, no, I'm going to put it into action. You see, whatever God gives you a burden for, the response for us is just start doing it. Well, what about all these details? Who cares? Start doing it. Well, Brad, you know, I, I sat back and said, Kelly, how are we going to keep children alive? How are we going to get our house ready? And she's like, just take the classes. Just start doing it. And if you just start doing it, all those details will work out because you're doing what God has wants you to do. And if God is going to call you to something, will he not equip you and qualify you for it? Yes, so the response is not, oh, I'm going to sit and wait on my calling. No, just do your calling. Let your light shine. Stop talking about bread. So at the end of it all, here's what I'm saying. Today, what do you do today? This is what you do. Pray that God would give you a passion for the brokenness in your community, whatever it is and then step out in faith and action and let your light shine. Because cities change when lights shine. Amen? But you bow your hearts with me this morning. Worship team is gonna come out in just a moment. And so this whole series has been a challenge for us to be city changers. And Pastor Brian and Pastor Jose did a great job of when they spoke to us about being city changers and what it looks like. And at the end of the day, you will only become a city changer if you put it into action. And so the altars are gonna be up this morning. Maybe there's something you're saying, God, I really wanna know what you want me to do. Man, the altars are open for you there. Some of us, we might say, you know what? I haven't been the light. I've been focused on myself. Man, the altar's here. Come in and confess that to God. Allow God to do a healing. Allow God to restore you. The altars are here not to be an embarrassment. It's here for us because we have to acknowledge we're broken people and this is where God does business with us. And we don't want to wait when God's working in our life. We want to act now. And God is calling each of us to let our light shine. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that Jesus did what only he could do. He was the true salt of the earth. Father, he was the city set on a hill as he hung there on Calvary. He allowed his light to shine, Father God, for all to see, and he draws men unto himself, Father, and everybody who puts their faith in him is made right again. They receive forgiveness of sins, and they are called to live your mission to take the same love to the darkest corners of the earth. Father, may we put our faith into action 
and reach out to the lostness and the brokenness in our cities. And when we see our cities change, you will receive all the glory and the honor forevermore because it is you who works. It's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen.